Well, want to welcome everybody to our CHIP webinar, and we gave the title for this, sort of a, a gutsy title, The Gut Microbiome, Why These Buggers Are Important in Emotions and Chronic Pain, and obviously they're important in a lot of things. Um, we are very excited to have what I know is world famous, Dr. Emron Meyer, whom I've known for a long time at UCLA. He's a distinguished uh, professor of research because he's still doing research at UCLA. And um, he's published more than 400 of the top scientific articles related to brain gut neurobiology and symptoms. And then uh, as the bio says, he started the uh, Microbiome Research Institute at UCLA. And uh, many of you have not even thought about microbiome, but they're really, really important in your body. And we're going to hear about that from Imran. Uh, Imran will also, he's written fabulous books. I've writ read all of them. And he has a PBS special, which I saw, I saved, and I make everybody see who comes over. And uh, he also has a weekly blog. And I always learn something really important from his blog, plus great recipes. Um, so he can tell you more later. And at the end, we can have, for those of you who want to um, follow Dr. Meyer and keep learning, we'll have that information. And any questions you have, put them in the chat box and uh, I will answer those. This is being recorded. And so if you wanna see it again or miss some part or know anybody who wasn't able to be here, let them know. And the way we're going to do this is as a Q and A. Um, so I think I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Meyer, and maybe start with the first question: What is the body's microbiome? Yeah. So first of all, uh, Lonnie, thanks for the kind introduction and for the invitation to have me on your podcast. Um, or on your webinar. Um, it's a pleasure after you know decades of interacting with you scientifically and, and, and clinically to uh, uh, to be on this uh, uh, be on this program. Um, yeah, so I mean the microbiome officially, it's really the microbiota, which refers to the number of microorganisms, a, a hundred trillion that lives in our gut. They live everywhere on epithelial interfaces in our body, but the gut is the place where there's the highest density, uh, greatest amount, um, about 100 trillion in the, um, concentrated in the second half, or let's say the, the, the last part of the intestine, last part of the small intestine, but mainly in the colon. Um, and these microbes have been studied based based on the question who is there so how uh, you know what's their uh, the number and how can they be identified what different um, genera and species are there um, in the meantime we know that um, I mean they obviously have a function and their function is encoded by a, a vast number of genes um, probably 100 million genes that they have, which um, if you compare this to the 20,000 genes, human genes that we have is, is, is mind boggling. And many of these genes, we don't even know what they do, what they encode. So microbiome re really refers to both the who is there and what do they do. So both the genes and the, and the prevalence of the organisms. But it's often now used um, Interchangeably, people just talk about the microbiome, you know, without making that difference. Mm -hmm. What is a healthy microbiome? Is there such a thing as a 
healthy microbiome, especially in the gut? Uh, and how do we know that? How do we achieve that? Yeah, this is a good question. <clears throat> I, I think, um, you know, people have kind of struggled with this answer. I think you can give the general answer, which applies to any ecosystem, which really the, the, the microbiome is complex ecosystem. Um, healthy ecosystems are characterized by a high diversity and a high richness. So diversity, how many different players are there and richness of what amount of each of these players is 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 present in the gut. So that applies to any ecosystem from nature to um, you know the world around us to cities, um, but definitely to uh, you know to our gut uh, to to these inhabitants. Um, if you want to drill further down, <clears throat> it gets more complicated because then um, you know what we so there's healthy people, and if you look at their their gut microbiome today in the U.S. It's not the healthiest microbiome that you could imagine. You have to go to the remnants of hunter-gatherer populations, a few, um, you know, tens of thousands of people that are left, um, and they have a much greater diversity and 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 richness than anybody else. But they live in the jungle and they live, you know, they they eat a particular food and they have a different lifestyle. So should that be our goal to have that as the standard? probably unrealistic, we're never going to get back to that point. Uh, or is it the healthy, or is it the microbiome of people that are healthy in, in, in our society, in our system? Um, and then we look at, you know, A, who is there? Uh, are there a lot of um, bacteria or, or microbes that produce um, short-chain fatty acids? That's another criteria which are sort of these endogenous, this endogenous aspirin um, of, of, of our bodies that we make together with the, with the microbes because it's this anti-inflammatory, these anti-inflammatory substances. So th the more of these butyrate producing uh, genera, species or strains that somebody has, you could say the healthier their microbiome is. But there's obviously different ways of defining it. So how do babies, and I love the, anyway, we won't go into the studies you may, I'll mention, but how do babies get their microbiome and when does that kind of become relatively stable for that individual? Yeah, so babies, uh, the most of the first inoculation, even though there's been some controversy, but I think it's pretty clear now, the first inoculation, um, of the sterile, um, you know, baby initially when it goes through the birth canal, it's exposed uh, to the vat to the, the maternal vaginal microbiome, and actually a mixture of the fecal and the vaginal microbiome of the mother during birth, um, and th that's essentially um, that's how babies have in the past or always were, you know thousands of years been programmed in their microbiome. Now there's a growing number of babies that come into this world with C-section deliveries uh, that essentially bypass this initial um, uh, programming. And it's it's interesting that a year, so when you look at the, the microbiome of these babies, they, they look very different from um, vaginally born. They don't have these maternal um, colonizers there, but um, if you look at them after a year, you know they're, they're very similar uh, to ones that are born um, uh, naturally, vaginally. And um, the the issue is what happens during that year. Does that make a difference? Yeah, there's a lot of things that happen during that year. The interaction with the immune system in the gut, um, which is also being being programmed. Um, so. That programming of the immune system, interactions of microbes with the immune system, is clearly different from um, of, of vaginally born and C-section born babies. And we know there's an increased prevalence of autoimmune diseases and obesity and aller uh, allergic diseases um, in the ones that don't have that natural first year of, of, of programming from the mother. Um, and... 
Yeah, so this is um, something which we'll see more and more because uh, C-section deliveries are um, countries like Italy and Brazil, so the majority now. There, there's some attempts to do this, this, this vaginal seeding, so basically taking a swab from the from the vagina after birth and um, um, transferring this to the baby uh, orally. Um, that has had some benefit, but the studies are not large enough, in my opinion, to say that this makes a huge difference. Um, what are some prenatal and postnatal factors that not later in life, but sort of perinatal, pre, post, that can affect, you think, uh, babies' gut microbiome as they develop? Yeah, I mean, let me start with with actually this this perinatal um, uh, period starting prenatally, which is not doesn't have the direct effect on the, the baby's microbiome, but it's important because the mother's microbiome obviously um, is also influenced by diet and stress and medications and particularly antibiotics, um, um, and. So if the mother's microbiome is compromised by these factors that we know really well today, then it produces metabolites or inflammatory mediators that cross the placenta and actually affect brain development of, of the infant. And th that's sort of an underappreciated factor. Um, but we do know from some studies that, uh, and there's, the, there's animal models, so the uh, the maternal immune um, activation model were inflammatory changes in the mother um, are, for example, a risk factor for autism spectrum diseases in the in the offspring. And this, these are not um, immune activations from an infection, but immune activations from, you know, a changed microbiome. And uh, so it it starts there. Right? The, the influences that the um, that the newborn gets from the microbiome, then the the factors that play a big role, um, the vaginal microbiome uh, of the mother, is also has been studied to be affected by by stress. There's animal models shown auditory stress, for example, can change it. Is also affected by by, by diet again and uh, and uh, antibiotic um, exposure. Even a one-time exposure to antibiotics could have that effect on on the mother's uh, vaginal mi uh, microbiome. So, even before the, the 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 baby sees the light of day, there's already several influences related to the microbiome that play a role in or that can influence you know brain development. Um, and this uh, and this early programming, so um, so the mode of delivery, the environment um, that that the mother is exposed to, <clears throat> which then so for example, if a stressed microbiome, vaginal microbiome, um, seeds the uh, the infant's gut, the studies that that has an effect on brain development in the infant. So what happens? Um, and so, you know, it's kind of surprising how many of these influences early on in life starting. Um, when I should mention, there's even now studies that show that the that the paternal, um, you know, microbiome. Um, so if if the fathers are exposed to antibiotics, and um, it this compromises the paternal microbiome, that even that has an influence in from from animal studies on the um, on the, on the microbiome of the offspring. So you may wonder why there's so many influences early on in life um, that that all have this ability to change this, this programming period. And it's probably nature has come up with this to prepare um, the, you know, the newborns, the, the, the offspring, to prepare them for a world that that nature sort of estimates based on what happens to the parents, to the mother and the father, and the, the diet and the stress level, um, and that all kind of programs then how the infant's microbiome is prepared for this world. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, with the kind of things that that you know 
that we're doing to both the fathers and the mothers with all these environmental exposures and, and dietary discretions, um, this is no longer adaptive. You know, this is really turned into a, a maladaptive mechanism. Any influence on baby's gut microbiome by breastfeeding? Um, yeah, so there's um, there's a group of molecules in, in breast milk, these human milk oligosaccharides, <clears throat> or HMOs, that are very large molecular molecules, uh, uh, very large molecules that cannot be absorbed by the infant's uh, gut. So they're not there for nutrition of the infant. Again, nature has designed those to go down to the new community of, of, of microbes and nurture them um, and, and again, influence their development because these human milk oligosaccharides are influenced by genetics of the mother, the diet of the mother. Um, so this is another mechanism that, um, uh, you know, that, that breastfeeding has a, has a big influence on this evolving ecosystem in, in the gut of uh, infants. And I mean, there were times in, in history, where, you know, where this was really discouraged, the, the breastfeeding were, um, and there's on the, on the other hand, there's some of these descendants of um, the hunter-gatherers, like the Yanomami uh, indigenous people on the uh, Orinoco or the Hastas in, in East Africa, that that nurse it, the children for for two or three years, so very different from from what what we used to do, you know. And um, the many children in the developing world, you know, Nestle has been a big um, promoter of this. With formula feeds, um, have completely bypassed that part because the formula feeds do, have not, do not contain um, these human milk oligosaccharides. These 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 programming language from the mother, from the from the, the breast milk to, to the infant's microbiome. What about a lot of parents ask, should I give my, my kid uh, probiotics, prebiotics over the counter? What's the best probiotic having more in there? Is that better than less? Can you address that, you know, in its variations? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm not totally familiar with the literature on on, on the, the pediatric use, but I do know, <clears throat> I mean, the studies on probiotics, the best studies that have shown, you know, a, a benefit um, um, in, in, in preventing some serious infections in in in, in babies <clears throat> um have have come from 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 infants and, and and from babies so the evidence in adults that um you know that probiotics really have a significant effect on either the health of somebody or uh treatment of a disease is is much more questionable you know there's um so I would say if there's any evidence that probiotics are beneficial, it would be in, in infants in a selection, selected group of, um, of, of infants. There's also this whole group of uh, preemies, prematurely born babies that obviously live in, in the worst possible um, environment for the developing microbiome. Repeated uh, antibiotic ex um, exposure um, Exposure to all the you know the, the the microbes that that are in the the hospital environment. So I'm I'm not familiar with the, the data on this, you know, dude. <clears throat> but I would think just from a from a um, theoretical basis that probiotics in that setting should actually be beneficial. Um, now, which ones in which dosage, um, that's something, that's a question I, I cannot really answer, you know. For adolescents and adults uh, who have been on a course of antibiotics because of whatever illness, after they finish their antibiotics, 
obviously that's had an impact on their gut microbiome. Should they be uh, going back on some kind of probiotic or can you comment on that? So there are, uh, you know, there are some studies on, on, I mean, there's one that I've been involved in myself, um, and this was in adults, or the, the, the post-antibiotic um, probiotics were actually beneficial for a, rec a, a restoration of the, of an, of the normal uh, gut microbiome. Um, and but it's controversial. I mean, the studies out of the Weizmann Institute in in in, in Israel, where the where, where the probiotics, a certain type of uh, mixture of probiotics, actually delayed the recurrence or the reseeding with the normal uh, microbiome. So there's there's kind of two schools around this. One is that it's it's beneficial to restore it more quickly. The other one that it delays the return of the normal microbiome. In general, <clears throat> it is kind of interesting. The and it points to the resilience of of this ecosystem. So in, so in general, you know, one dose of antibiotic, almost everybody in the world has gotten this during their lifetime and early on in life, um, shows a transient decrease in diversity and, and richness, but with a very quick return to the normal level. Now that's affected partially by what micro, what diversity you start out with. If you really have a compromised microbiome, um, because you know you were uh, delivered by C-section or because you know your, your mother was stressed or any any early life factors, if you really start out with a compromised Micro microbial ecosystem, then <clears throat> your resilience is probably less to return to normal. There have been early studies that even three times <clears throat> consecutive antibiotic exposure, it comes back to almo almost its normal level. So resilience is it's another property of a healthy um, ecosystem that you know it has a strong resilience. Question: I want to move on about sort of mechanisms of like gut microbiome and mental health. But before I do that, there was a question sort of going back to babies born by C-section. One um, attendee wrote that she heard that babies born by C-section are exposed to a wider variety of microbiome by all of the staff in the in the delivery room and in fact may have a richer microbiome than those born vaginally. Any data on that? Um, I I don't know the I mean the only thing I know about it that the that that the, the microbes that are dominant in in this early hospital setting or the delivery room um, will will basically take the role of this early colonization. But but they don't have the same <clears throat> as we know because I mean there are these these increased prevalence of you know obesity and and and, and autoimmune diseases they're not as effective in 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 teaching like the immune system early on you know what's good and bad and what the um, what the immune cells have to attack so I would say yes they do take over I don't think this has any benefit over the um, over the C-section uh, colonization, because otherwise you wouldn't have these, you know, this increased prevalence of these diseases, uh, which are, you know, pretty serious. Could you explain? And I know in your I'm looking at your shelf in the Mind Gut Connection book, which I read as soon as it came out. Um, it sort of how, and a lot of people don't understand how does. How do organisms in your intestine actually affect your emotions? Can you sort of explain that? Yeah, so that concept really came up um, after the first pioneering studies in in animals, in mice, and um, that you know the microbiome or the absence of the microbiome in so-called germ-free um, animals 
would affect the behavior of, of these animals, or you could transfer um, emotion-like behaviors from one type of mouse to another just by uh, transplanting the, the microbiome. Um, those experiments, I, I mean, quite honestly, I, I didn't believe those early on because it just seemed too far-fetched. Um, and but in the meantime, it's been you know confirmed in in, in many follow-up studies. Unfortunately, we don't have the same kind of follow-up or the same kind of confirmation. This is always the problem with with many of these studies: this, this translation, this failure of translation to to the human situation, because you can't do. Obviously, you can't translate from a, a you know stool from from a human without a microbiome to to one with or transplant stool from a person with um, you know bipolar disorder and in, into somebody in a healthy person so there's there's big ethical concerns and we'll probably we'll probably never get to that point but we but we are able and this has been shown out repeatedly it's kind of state of the art of of having some substitutes for the to demonstrating causality that you can um, you can take the microbiome from an individual with a particular disease and put this into a germ-free mouse uh, or a humanized mouse with a human-like microbiome, and then this mouse will adapt some of the behavioral traits um, that the, the human donor had. Um, so I, I think if you put all this together, there's there's no question that the microbes in some way in humans play a role in emotion regulation. Um, now, how important that is in the in 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 the pathophysiology, for example, of of depression, anxiety disorders, um, that's that's another question. You know, would if you had one of these disorders, would you be happy just getting um, you know, either getting probiotics or getting a fecal microbial transplant um, without any, um, you know, without any uh, medications. If your symptoms are mild, you would probably be, would want to give it a try, but the fecal microbial transplantation has failed so far in, 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 in humans. It has to have a significant effect um, really on any disease other than a particular form of colitis. And um, so right now, I think um, what the stance is, we have these experiments that I told you, these transplant experiments, mouse to mouse and human to mouse, which are pretty convincing. Uh, we also have from the evolutionary history, some amazing findings that, you know, the, the language that the microbes developed during uh, billions of years of evolution, living being the only life form in the oceans um, that this language that they developed and stored in their genes in their 100 million genes that this language has been um, transferred to the first prim primitive marine animals um, which were these floating digestive tubes and then with further evolution they went from uh, from the gut and the enteric nervous system, the nerves in the gut, these genes were then transferred to to the first brains of, 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 of so the neurotransmitters or the, I should say the language that our brains use, the chemical language that our brains used really uh, you know arose billions of years ago in 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 the microbial communication. Um, so that's a very convincing argument that um, there is a, a connection, and the microbes can, if everybody speaks the same language, can affect you know, the system in, in, in the brain as well. So there's also, in the meantime, a lot of um, basic science experiments. Um, so so my, my, my colleague at UCLA, Elaine Zhao, is sort of been a pioneer in, 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 these, in these studies, showing that uh, these specific changes that occur by manipulating the gut microbiome in the brain, in the in the vagal, in the vagus nerve, and it's this brainstem nuclei of the vagus nerve. Um, I think it's always a question um, with, you know, how how big that influence is compared to the others. 
so both of us have been around with this explosion of knowledge and you know the the, the whole biology of the central stress systems and emotion systems i mean you know biological psychiatry is sort of um, has had an amazing run in characterizing all these systems in the brain um but we're a long way away from having that same knowledge base from the from the microbiome i, I think um so i always say yes it's almost certainly is a modulating influence of the microbial influence um but the main driver of the emotions or the primary driver in, in my opinion is still um circuits within you know within the brain that then can be modulated by microbial influences so somebody asked how do you know if you don't have a healthy gut microbiome yeah this is an often asked question and there's obviously a, a big industry and growing industry of um of companies that um do these fecal microbial stool testing. And um, typically you get a, a report, a 40, pi, 40 page report listing all the all the genera that you have in your gut and which are good and bad. And um, so in my opinion, that's not really a way forward. This was one step in the evolution of this. In the meantime, we have more accurate um, ways of uh, assessing the, the the microbiome, um, we, we can measure like the genes uh, the, and that are being expressed in uh, that are there and that are being expressed in the gut by the microbes, and then conclude from 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 these genes what the functions are and if which functions are 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 missing. <clears throat> I would say if if you're completely healthy and you have no, um, you know either psychological, psychiatric, or, or metabolic diseases, um, and you're on a healthy diet, I personally don't think you need a, you need to confirm this with a, with, with a test that at best right now is, is not really conclusive. Furthermore, most physicians, the majority, when a patient comes with these reports and asks you, uh, I don't understand what this means, can you explain this to me? So 95% of physicians would not be able to give a, a um, you know, an evidence-based explanation of that. So you stuck with that report and say, oh, I have a few bad players in my gut. And um, so I've done some of these tests just out of, just out of curiosity and could not see a, a link between um, anything that, you know, like in my life, um, which was for a long time, you know, greatly influenced by chronic stress, work-related stress. <laughs> I could not see a, a pattern in the in the microbiome that, that would tell me more than what I already knew about my, my stress level. So I would say in the future we will there will be a progression. The most exciting things is that it might be a way of early diagnosis of risk factors, for example, for autism, uh, for um um yeah, I'm going to come back to the autism spectrum, but early risk factors for neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and and Alzheimer's disease, that that I think will become the most exciting potential of of, of these stool tests. Um, if you are somebody um, you know who is on a on a very unhealthy diet and you go on the regimen of or, or you, you know you've started to switch to a gut friendly diet. But you don't have the motivation without constantly retesting your microbiome and seeing there's actually a, an improvement in in some of the bugs that produce the you know the, the anti-inflammatory butyrate. Then it's it's another you know costly thing that 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 some people will do. Coming back to the autism um, spectrum that I briefly mentioned, <laughs> there it's probably more important in in the mothers in the in the in the pregnant mothers um I, I think we mentioned this before there's a significant influence of the metabolic health of the mother um this low grade immune activation or um it's called metabolic endotoxemia 
what effect this has on, de on, the, on the developing brain. So for the pregnant mother to do one of these tests and, you know, if that shows there's an absence or a, a, a sparsity of these butyrate producing organisms, uh, then this, this might be an indication for this mother. Yeah, I really need to change something in my diet or, <clears throat> uh, you know, do lifestyle modifications, decreasing weight, obesity, um, that, that may have a negative effect on my, on my baby. Um, somebody asked, how do you know if you don't have a healthy gut microbiome, microbiota? Um, well, so the easy way is if you have symptoms, you know, so, um, a, a lot of people, you know, experience discomfort, most typically bloating, increased gas production, um, can go all the way to, to pain, you know, if you go in the direction of IBS, um, then there's, um, there's a likelihood that your your microbes play a role in this, and you know, as you know, there's a big. Um, it's gotten a lot of publicity. This whole SIBO concept, this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I mean, in my training, you know, this overgrowth was a rare condition that happened in people that had a truncal vagotomy or had scleroderma, where the motility of their intestine was severely compromised. In the meantime, just about everybody has has SIBO, you know. So it's a big industry because SIBO means for for many physicians a course of antibiotics, which I think is a is a terrible thing because you know the last thing you want to do is throw in antibiotics to a potentially compromised microbiome. Um, so I would say if if you have one of those conditions and you feel like your gut does not uh, function properly, um, then it's likely, not 100%, it's likely that the, the microbes play a role in this. Um, and you may have a healthy microbiome, but for example, your gut may be more sensitive to the gas production by the microbiome. So the, the microbes are okay, but one of the, the the metabolic end products that microbes generate is is gas, um, and if your gut is more sensitive to distensions from a normal amount of gas, then you will get the bloating and the distension. And the, so this is for the much more common scenario, and it's not because you have a compromised gut microbiome. There's a lot of these myths out there, and. I've I've almost given up on trying to to <laughs> correct people's views on that, but uh, it's so ingrained and it's so reinforced by the medical system and by the pharmaceutical companies, because this is obviously a big source of revenue. You know, the uh, treatment of antibiotics for for hundreds of thousands of people. How do you repair an unhealthy microbiome? Let's go back to that definition that we have, you know, decreased diversity um, and possibly, uh, you know, a lack of decrease in, in butyrate producing microbes um, and a decreased richness. Yeah, you may, you, you may start out with, um, with, with, with two things. I mean, there's a study now, and I think it definitely needs to be confirmed that uh, the consumption of naturally fermented foods will increase, will improve these parameters um, more than the fiber in, in intake. So currently, based on limited amount of data, I would say the best approach is start with these naturally fermented foods. If you don't like them, so this is, you know, the kefir, kombucha, different types of yogurt or fermented milk products, um, um, if you don't like it, you know, you, you can go to one of these um, multi-strain probiotics and, and do that as well. The studies are not as clear-cut as they are from this naturally fermented food study. So what this study has shown is that the microbial diversity and richness increases 
not just with the microbes like lactobacilli or bifidobacteria that you ingested with these foods, but other microbes also now all of a sudden show up. So where they come from and um, were they already present in non-detectable numbers or do they come from the environment, from these foods that you naturally fermented foods you came that, that you bought, um, it's, it's not known. But the, the, the approach that I would recommend to patients, if you got microbiome or if you feel it's really compromised, start with a course of four weeks of enriching your diet with multiple uh, natural fermented foods, and then increase the, the fiber intake. And some people you know, get side effects. If you do this all of a sudden, you've got microbes are not used, not all the right players are there that break down the, 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 the fiber molecules, but gradually increasing the number and variety of these fibers. I mean, there's thousands of fiber molecules. It's not just, um, you know, taking one one type of fiber and think that will take care of it. Just think think back what an what a what an ecosystem will do. So you don't have enough players. You don't have enough spe specialists. Now, if you expose the system to different challenges by different fiber molecules. The system will add new special, will hire new specialists uh, to, that can handle these, and so you gradually attract. I mean, just like what you would do in a in a city that has a lot of immigrants from different parts of the world, you increase the diversity, and they all contribute something to this, to the overall functioning and the output of the system. So I would say, first go to a variety of naturally fermented foods, then introduce a variety of um, of fiber and then stay on that diet on a prolonged period of time. I think the best evidence we have, um, you know, that you can actually positively affect your microbiome's health is doing taking that approach. There will be more studies in the future, I'm sure, but. Can you comment, I know it's a pet peeve of mine, but sort of from the beginning studies in Australia on the FODMAP diet and how many gastroenterologists are now recommending a FODMAP diet for adults. And since that's hard for adolescents, a modified FODMAP, FODMAP diet. Can you comment on that? Yeah, like so many of these popular concepts, I'm not, I'm not a fan of it. So I, I, I list, um, you know, FODMAP diet, a, a low FODMAP diet, under the same umbrella as, you know, my attitude towards SIBO and, uh, you know, many, many of these other things. Um, clearly, if you take out of your diet um, components such as, for example, dairy, where we know you know, um, in some population, 90% of adults um, are deficient in lactase, so cannot break down uh, lactose. It's a normal condition. It's not a disease. Genetically, milk breast was focused on, breast, like evolution focused on breast milk, um, and that's not necessary after maximally three years, the first three years. So, you know, we have sort of continued this and expanded this with you know, milk consumption, milk product, uh, dairy products. So these are these. This is one component of of the of the FODMAP diets of the FODMAP. So the uh, dairy products. And there's there's other complex um, fiber molecules, complex carbohydrates, that are actually the food for the optimal food for the microbes. So you take that out, and what happens is, the so the microbes now have less material to break it down, and there's always this gas production associated with this breakdown. So you generate less gas, and <clears throat> most people on a low FODMAP diet will sh show a decrease in their symptoms of, of bloating um, and, and some IBS symptoms. But Essentially, because you take out now a lot of the food for the for the microbes, it's not healthy. You know, it's it's not sustainable. So then, people have come up with this modified FODMAP diet or 
the reintroduction of some of these components later. You can do it this way. You know, um, the traditional way that that uh, that I recommend is you start with what I would call the default diet for for human and microbial health, which is a is a Mediterranean type diet. Does not Italian, not you know southern France or or Spain. Essentially, you know, seventy five percent of of the diet comes from uh, plant based products. Um, a small amount from um, either no meat or no red meat or a, a sm very small amount. Um, and, and you take out other components also that, um, you know, that that are part of the standard American diet. You start out with that diet, which we know is the best long-term health. For all the studies now pointing in that direction, no matter what disease you look at, it's a decreased risk on that diet. A lot of IBS patients have no problem with it either, but some will just they they know their their trigger foods, you know, like broccoli, um, um, cruciferous vegetables, um, onions, garlic. Most people don't have more than five of those components of a plant based diet. So when I tell them, start on the diet keep a diary, see which foods consistently, that's important, uh, increase your symptoms, then decrease them or eliminate them for a couple of weeks and see if consistently the symptoms get better. Then you have a, then you end up with a personalized diet that is your optimal uh, you know, diet, both from your microbiome and for your own health. Um, and which in my opinion is is better than starting with a standardized diet for everybody, which we know in the meantime, you know, personalization is 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 a key, is a catchword also in in, in in the dietary world. And also it 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 engages the patient. So the, the patient becomes an active player in designing um the, the, in in influencing their own health, which I think is particularly in patients with IBS or other functional symptoms, is always important. So this feeling of uh, uh, control that you have over your symptoms, I think is is part of the part of the therapy. I need to ask a question that um, when we had a uh, a webinar on Ehlers Danlos, there is a lot of discussion on GI symptoms in especially IBS type symptoms, chronic nausea in the EDS or in the non the hyper the non-genetic marker identified EDS uh, hyper uh, flexibility. Can you? comment on are there any data on the role of the microbiome in EDS? Um, I have to admit I'm not aware of it so I can't answer that question. What about um, the kid or the adolescent who's had persistent nausea no other GI symptoms but persistent nausea worked up to the zoo can't find a reason is can that be related to gut microbiome and diet? So generally, you know, nausea. I mean, there's different types of nausea, as as as, as you know. You know, some can be centrally generated, just within brain circuits. Others are response to vagal stimulation, um, and <clears throat> I mean, typically the vagus nerve innervates the the more proximal part of the small intestine. We have fewer microbes, so in in theory, it is possible um, that in a selected group of of patients, you know that that metabolites that the microbes produce would stimulate receptors on these vagal afferent terminals uh, that that generate nausea. Um, there's also this form, you know, of, of of nausea and and recurrent vomiting, which is a, a totally different this cyclical vomiting syndrome. Is a, is a very different syndrome. I don't think I've not seen data on 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 this, and that seems to be, um, you know, based on what we know, primarily generated by an hyperactive 
um, stress response system and release of stress mediator, uh, mediators in the in the brain that stimulate that, that these these symptoms of recurrent uh, nausea and vomiting. But just the nausea itself. Um, this is the thing about the microbiome. Now you can implicate it in just about any disease that up to now we didn't have an explanation for. In theory, it's it is possible, you know. And just say a little bit about the complexity of the vagus nerve. Um, it's not just one one highway, you know. It's um, again from the work of Elaine Chow at, at 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 UCLA. We know there's subtypes of these vagal sensory fibers that have different receptors on them, um, and each of them innovates a different part of the the, the intestinal wall. So from the from the mucosa to the to the muscular wall and to the enteric nervous system, they all transmit different information to the to the brain. So it's it's, it's very plausible that one of these fibers, subtypes of the vagus nerve, actually are a trigger, a chronic trigger of nausea. Um, how you would treat this? I mean, certainly, you know. <laughs> You wouldn't do a, a a a vagotomy as we used to do for peptic ulcer disease, but um, yeah. So in in terms of the therapeutic implications, I I don't think that there are any at the moment. And then a last question: We we have three minutes left. Let's say they have a plant based diet, very rainbow diet, more colors. That's great. And then they supplement with vitamin B twelve. Is there any data to support that if you're otherwise eating a healthy plant-based rainbow diet? Well, if the diet doesn't contain any um, any meat, then yes, vitamin B12 um, supplementation would be a good idea. Uh, you know, this definitely in, in vegans, that is a risk um, that they would develop a vitamin B12 deficiency. There is... B12 also in um, in other food components other than red meat. So, but I think the safest way in that case would be to take, you know, to take your your pills. Um, that's one of the supplements that I would say we have pretty good evidence for for its uh, effectiveness. Um, and when when you say you know healthy uh, plant based diet, I, I think, and it's hard to interpret this. So. The vegan diets don't seem to have an advantage over, um, for example, a Mediterranean diet. Uh, the vegans will probably, you know, contest that statement, but there's several studies that have come out to, uh, to show that. Uh, if you do it for religious purposes, yes, totally fine. I can totally uh, in, in, endorse this, but don't do it because you want to optimize your, uh, your 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 health, so the health of the microbiome. This is a nice thing about the. The Mediterranean style diets, you know, that they are not extreme diet. It's not an extreme diet. It's it has pretty much everything, but the ratio of um compared to the standard American diet where, you know, the dominance is 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 red meat and um and animal-based fats. Um it's definitely a, a yes to that answer. It's a good thing to take that vitamin B12 supplement. So I'm noticing there's one minute left and there's a bunch of questions like prokinetics and others that we won't have time for, uh, but many of them are answered in Dr. Meyer's books. Just Google him and you'll be amazed. Uh, and his weekly blog, I Learn a Lot and Get Great Diet, uh, Great Recipes. Um, I want to thank you, Emran, for giving us the time. Any small donation to help keep us afloat will be more than welcome, and you can do that on the website. Thank you, Emran. This was terrific. <laughs>